Hi, everyone. Again, this is Eugene Hernandez, director of the New York Film Festival, and I'm here with director of Time, Garrett Bradley. Um, welcome again, Garrett. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm looking forward to, I've been looking forward to a conversation with you. Um, we have a whole bunch of films in this year's festival, and uh, it just so happens that your film was, of all the films in this year's festival, the one I saw first this mm -hmm. year because I saw it at Sundance. So it's been out in the world a little bit and um, you've had a chance to share it with some audiences. Um, but it, it, it was really meaningful for us to be able to invite you to this year's festival and to be able to share your film with our audience. So first of all, just thank you and congratulations. Thank you, it's such an honor to be here. I think it's like every filmmaker's dream actually to be able to, to share their film with you all. And even though it's virtual, this year I can feel all the good vibes and the good energy and I'm just so thankful, you know, to the festival and to the programmers and, and to you and for your time speaking with me. Well, thank you again. So let me dig in. I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions uh, about the making of the film and and about um, the, the world in which the film is being introduced also uh, to a wider audience. Um, but you know, the first question is sort of an easy one and it's just really to kind of set the stage. Um, this is such a remarkable family, um, first and foremost. And um, I'll ask you in a minute about how you constructed this, this look at this period in their lives. But before that, maybe just tell me and share with our audience a little bit about um, how you how you met this family. Where does your relationship with this family begin? Do you remember uh, what, what, uh, what instigated um, or what connected you to this family? Yeah, I mean, I think, so similar to all of my work, actually, I came to this project just by way of um, living life and, and being curious and, um, and wanting to respond to the things that I was observing around me and to be able to contribute in some kind of way to a larger conversation around what I felt um, I wanted to talk about and wanted more people to talk about. Um, I met Fox in the process of making a short film for the New York Times Op Docs called Alone. And I made Alone um, because I had made another film in 2014, my first, um, feature length film called Below Dreams, which premiered at Tribeca in 2014. And that was almost entirely cast off of Craigslist. And I'd become very close with one of the actors in the film, Desmond, and I became even closer with his partner, Lon. And when he was arrested for a nonviolent offense and awaiting trial for about a year and a half in a private prison, we made a film together about what it meant to make decisions in your life as a woman, as a mother, as a partner, um, while being in limbo. And what struck me was that there were very few resources, very few people, family or friends, for her to speak with because of the stigma around incarceration and the stigma around loving somebody who is incarcerated. Um, and so I had initially thought of alone as being a facilitation of conversations between that were intergenerational between other women as a way of providing a sense of support and basic information around what to do. And I contacted an organization called Flick, Friends and Families of Louisiana's Incarcerated Children. And Gina Womack, who is one of the co-founders and directors of that organization, picked up the phone and said the first person you need to speak with is Fox Rich. And so Fox is actually in, in alone. And I got to know her in the process of, of making that film. Um, and I think for me, it became incredibly important to think about what it would mean to make a sister film to alone, to extend the conversation of, of understanding incarceration from a black feminist point of view, from a familial point of view, from a point of view that focuses on the effects um, of incarceration and so and to do that in a way that also allowed for there to be a, a diversification in that experience and tell me about then one of the early conversations that you can remember with her about your idea and and what and 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 was your idea for how you would explore whether her life or some of the issues that you just talked about was that already crystallized or how did that evolve from those early conversations? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I was really hell-bent on this sister film concept. And, right. you know, I mean, visually, I could even just see the two films next to each other, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of just a, a, literally a poster, you know? And so the aesthetic, the way in which I wanted the camera to live with Fox and with the family were to a certain extent kind of predetermined because they were coming off of what I felt was a template that I had kind of created with Alone um, in terms of thinking about Dutch angles, thinking about perspective and, and zooms as a way of reinforcing a lot of the, the themes inadvertently that, that, were, that were happening in the lives of, of, of Alon of, and, and Fox and, and the family. Um, and I think what really thwarted that um, and ultimately made it a better film, um, what thwarted my agenda was Fox handing me 19 years worth of home videos um, on our last day of shooting. Um, and, and my not knowing that they existed um, and having to kind of re, completely reapproach all of my, all of my masterminded ideas around what this was wow. going to be. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, I, I have to understand then, I have to ask you um, to share a little bit of insight before we talk about what, how your life transformed when you were handed 19 years of footage. Put that mm -hmm. off for a second. Um, what did the film look like or what, what were the elements of the film, especially in relation to what we've now watched, um, yeah. before you had that footage? You know what I mean? Like what was, what, how, what was, the, what was the, the frame of the film? What was the approach? Well, the frame of the film was, was actually, to me, really, also really baked in in the process of shooting it, which I think yeah. is kind of, maybe opens up an interesting conversation. I would love to know with other filmmakers as well of to what extent one is really doing that in the process of shooting a documentary, right? right. Um, for me, I try, my own process is ultimately to make a decision about why I'm making the film. And the reason that I'm making that film is what informs where I wanna be and when I want to be there. Um, and, and when I say that, it, it means that like, I wanted people to understand how the system involves itself into every single element of a person's life, mm -hmm. into every single piece of minutia of a person's life, that there is no separation between yourself, your daily routine, and the way in which um, the criminal injustice system uh, infiltrates. And so how could I show that? Well, we need to be with her when she's at work. We need to see the way in which she's able to be with her family, with her sons, with herself. Um, and so if I didn't, you know, and I didn't know if, if Robert was gonna be released or not, right? So that's also something where you have to say, how will I know that I've made a complete film? How, how will we know that we've done justice to this story without necessarily a happy ending? Um, and so the best way to do that was to show the daily routine. And, and so that was the shape and the form of it. Um, and I think the archive is what revealed something I could have never, ever shown um, in terms of the, her youth and, um, and her vulnerability and who she was prior to 19 years of making phone calls multiple times a day, every day for 21 years. So, okay, so then, uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, so you, so she hands over this archive, which I assume is just tapes of different, over the course of 19 years, formats changed, right? The videotape formats changed and evolved. So that's mm -hmm. a thing. But um, you, so you got all of this material, uh, how many hours of material? I think it was about 100 hours. So you've got 100 okay. hours of material, probably on different formats, and you've got to spend some time with it, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. What were the, as you spent time with that and it gave you a window into her life or family's life um, over a, a span of time, two decades almost, um, mm -hmm. what were the things about experiencing that footage that surprised you or changed your understanding of her, of her family, of her life, mm -hmm. or what were the things that, that that grounded or or supported sort of maybe what you what you brought to you know your own expectations of your own relationship with her because you already knew her for a period of time mm -hmm. but this is going to give you a whole other window right yeah totally i mean i think that it's really difficult because the the people that we meet um 
you and I are, are interacting with each other as we are today, you know, and there's so many things that have brought us to this moment or to this minute even in terms of where we are emotionally, psychically, and you know, and there's so many things that are feeding into to the to the person that we that we come across at any given moment. And and so what the archive offered was I think the ability to really show. I believed, I felt, and knew um, what a radical free spirit Fox was. But um, it was very difficult to show that in the context of the framing that I was just speaking of, right? Um, and so the archive allowed, I think, for, for the film to show a, the, the possibility of inner and self revolution that happens, you know, that we could see how Fox had changed over time. We've seen her many different lifetimes. We've seen her evolve um, in ways over time that, that I could have never um, shown, you know? And I think it's it's similar to even with, with her sons. I mean, they all are their own individual people who've really come into themselves in a unique way. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, I think having, having that history starts, you start to pick the pieces together of, oh, that's why freedom is who he is. That's why freedom is so focused on the politics and is going to become a mayor one day, you know? Um, and that's why, you know, Remy is, is such a natural leader and loving person. He was the oldest one and he was responsible for taking care of people a lot when he was younger. So I think it was a, we were able to show the genesis of, of what we eventually, um, of the folks that we come to, to meet and know in the present moment, you know? Mm -hmm. The film, it's really two films. I mean, I think in many ways it's Fox's film and my film that make a third film, <laughs> which is the one that we're watching, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, I remember seeing the film at that first screening at Sundance and, um, it was a very moving experience, uh, being able to watch it again recently to prepare for the conversation with you today. Um, I see different things and even in my own life, I'm watching it with, with maybe just different things in my mind, you know, what's, what's happening in our world, in people around me, in my life, the city I'm in, in New York, um, the, the, country that you unveiled this film to back in January has been through so much in not not even a year you know just a, just like 10 months or nine months whatever it is, at this point eight or nine months I should say since you unveiled the film um how have you thought about um uh, what the film says or what you hope it might um, instigate a conversation that might provoke or invite um, now versus when you showed it to an audience for the first time back in January? You know, I think that um, I'm going to sound crazy for a moment, but I actually, I just sound like my conspiracy, conspiracy theorist partner who's like on TikTok 24 seven, but I, I really do <laughs> feel like 2020 is a revealing it's it's a revealing of everything that's always been there you know um it's not new actually it's just clearer um and so i'm not sure that my intent has changed and i'm not sure that that um the effort uh and fox's story um the family story the context unfortunately is exactly the same the benefit is that we um we can see it more and and maybe people who are in no way touched by the system in a direct way from their life can start to relate to what isolation is and what it means to be separated from your loved one. Um, and, and that might be an entry point that is new. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, we are in the process of peeling all the layers. Do you, do you look at any of your creative choices differently now, whether with the time of just, you know, being able to look back at, at January and when you watch the film now, maybe you watch it differently, but also in light of, you know, just 
just conversations that are different and opportunities, um, I think, for conversation and openness. There's, there's some folks who, for whom the conversation hasn't changed one bit and it's just as urgent and relevant as it was, you know, um, a year ago or 10 years ago. But on the other hand, there, whether it be political leaders or folks around the country, around the world who will see your film, um, I wonder, you know, I just wonder about that, that uh, how you view creative choices in that context also. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that the creative choices that I try to make with my work are, I'd like to think of them as being reflections of the spirit of the people that I'm working with. Yeah. Um, and so they're always hopefully in dialogue um, with with who who we are with. Um, and I, I mean, I, I actually I feel that um, I think that you know Bell Hooks talks about this a lot, and I think it's a part of an ongoing conversation right now about what you know the sort of the power of the Black Family Archive and and what that serves and means um, again not just in this moment i mean always but i think it's a it's a when we see now in popular culture it's starting to um, resurface of what it means to build your own image to take control of your own image and to create your own archive and to not rely on anybody else to do that um, i think from a creative standpoint that that angle of the conversation um, and Fox's own uh, foresight in, in self-documentation is, um, is something to, to reckon with um, more and more as, as we go through the year and in the future. Well, it is fascinating to hear you talk about this because you know, there's a broader narrative about like, on the one hand, we have to document our lives sometimes to like prove that they existed or to to make to, to show that that we were there um, on the other hand as we saw as we've seen as we continue to see to this day in our country um, if something isn't documented sometimes uh, it may never be seen in the atrocity and the horror of what is happening over and over and over again for decades um, now we have the ability to document it, and were it not documented, if you know some of the atrocities of police brutality were not documented this year by women in this country, um, you know we wouldn't be having the rich conversations we're having, and 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 sadly, um, you know, men and women who've been killed by police wouldn't their their lives may not even have been noticed by people beyond their in the immediate community. Mm -hmm. um, so the power of visualization and visual documentation and archive like takes on such, such rich and, you know, intense mm. meaning. I would say even in the context of, you know, specifically when we talk about incarceration, because part of its power is that it's a seemingly invisible thing. You mm -hmm. know, how, how do we conceive the idea of 2.3 million people being incarcerated, separated from their families? and from the ability oftentimes even to communicate. Um, that's a very difficult thing, I think, for most of us to truly wrap our minds around. Um, and so again, the archive and what bearing witness on the other side of that, from the outside, from the family's perspective, is in many ways the only visualization that we have of mm. this chronic problem. Mm. Um, one more question for you as we're wrapping up. Um, and it really is a creative one. Um, there is something truly moving and so fitting and appropriate in the way you chose to conclude your film. Um, the notion of kind of re-engaging that archive through these through these images that that uh, take us backwards. Um, and it's it's truly um, it's a remarkable way to conclude a look at the span of a, a period of time in someone or someone's lives. Um, can you maybe just elaborate on the creative choice and the delicate balance of finding the right, uh, not just the right images, but, but sort of the right, the right um, combination and the right amount of time to, to provide that, that coda, which is so meaningful, so powerful. 
Well, to be honest, if we, if deadlines didn't exist, I think they would just be endless. It would be like on the, <laughs> it just would never end. Um, Cause you just keep seeing new things in it, you know, as, as you watch. And I, I think something that Gabe and I, Gabe Rhodes, who is the editor on the song, something that we talked about was um, for Fox, this for her was the first time in watching footage since she had shot it 19 years prior. And for Robert, this was his, the first time he was able to connect images with probably memory and voice um, and visitation, uh, but not actually physically being there for birthdays and for holidays. And so, um, mm. you know, I think that for me, the choice was very much about thinking about Robert in that way, um, thinking about what it would mean to you know, when you're just on the phone with somebody and you can hear things, I mean, your mind is imagining, but you don't, you don't necessarily know. And so being able to provide a, a space for those things to come to life in their context. Um, and I think ultimately, you know, ending the film that way was important for us because um, the real question is just how much time is enough time and how are we, what is time? How do we think about time in this sort of, um, colonial linear perspective, um, or is it something a little bit more complex that lives inside of us and that is always present? Um, and so I think trying to find a way to play with that and to speak to it um, as the as the family reunites was was really important for us. And and there was no map roadmap for how we were going to do that. I mean, it ultimately kind of just boiled down to just messing around and 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 seeing like what what started to feel with what actually hit our heart regardless of logic or linearity specific, specifically in the context of filmmaking you know letting go of that mm -hmm. um the film is called time and um garrett bradley we've been, it's been so special for us to have the opportunity to experience the film as as a group of programmers this year and to be able to um, to bring it to the New York Film Festival is one of the first films, as I mentioned, the first film I saw and one of the first films we invited um, from this year's festival. And it's just so meaningful to have you um, joining us virtually from the West Coast in this case to, to be part of the festival. I want to thank you for just agreeing to be part of this, for allowing us to show the film and to share it with our audience. It's such an unconventional year, but um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I really hope that, um, I hope that everything goes really well for you and for the film. Just thank you again. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure and such an honor. Thank you.